Hey everybody, welcome to Mr. Kenny's Ancient History class. Today we are going to talk about a uh, pretty fun part of Roman history, Diocletian dividing and Constantine conquering. So let's begin. All right, so hopefully you've been following along with our uh, list of emperors and some of the great stories. Diocletian is uh, one of the all-time best emperors of Rome. He is going to inherit Rome when it is completely trashed. We just had our military anarchy where we had over 100 people saying that they were Roman emperor in 26 years and uh, all of them <laughs> being killed. Um, Diocletian, he starts off looking like he's going to be a similar story. He was a military general uh, who is proclaimed uh, Caesar. He's proclaimed emperor. And so one of the things that um, we realized that was happening is so the emperor would be in Rome. And of course, we know Rome is getting invaded and attacked from all over. And so when Rome would be invaded and attacked from all over, they would send a general to go deal with it, right? But the problem was when that general would get a great victory, they declare themselves emperor and then proceed to start a civil war. And Diocletian realizes that this is not a recipe for success. So he comes up with a great idea. He goes and first elevates one of his colleagues, one of his friends, Maximum, as co-emperor. And the idea was he would rule... Um, and but give equal power to Maximum. And then when there needed to be a military conflict, he would send him out. And there's no reason why he would go start a civil war because he already had the power. Now, this works out great. But then we see um, Diocletian realizing this could be better. So he actually winds up dividing Rome uh, into two with two emperors known as Augustuses. So you have two Augusta, I guess would be the Latin, um, after Augustus, the first and probably greatest Roman emperor, and then two Caesars. And the idea was you could have four times as many things being done at once. Everybody has power, so everybody is happy. So we have a better administration. We have a ton being done under Diocletian with this new way. Um, he sets up a system where we have the two Augustus, and eventually the idea is when those Augustuses are gone, those Caesars are elevated to Augustus, and then two new worthy candidates are made Caesar. Now, this sounds a lot like our five good emperors, how they selected someone who is going to go and be the best possible ruler. So this is a recipe for success. Excuse me, success, and it is going to be incredibly effective. Um, Diocletian is going to wind up really cleaning up Rome. He's going to get rid of a lot of corruption. He is going to realize that there's a tremendous inflation problem meaning money is becoming worthless. Too many coins have been minted. Now, Diocletian tries to fix this by going and uh, recalling some of the money, not enough, unfortunately, and then making new coins that were very high quality. Because uh, one of the things that would happen is you have these coins, they're copper, silver, and gold. Uh, copper worth at least silver, medium, and gold worth a lot. Um, but the like the gold and silver coins with emperors prior to him would be using less and less gold, less and less silver. So there was legitimately less valuable metals in them, so they were less valuable. Um, he is going to make some very nice coins, but there's still going to be too many coins out there in circulation. So then he gets an even better idea. He breaks down the whole empire and figures out how can I go and tax these people well and has people... Uh, start paying in kind the things that they produce. So if you are a cobbler, a person who makes shoes, you have to make this many shoes, and that is your tax. If you are someone who uh, does transportation, you have to transport this many goods or this many times. Um, and he really winds up helping out the system. Uh, the one sour mark on Diocletian's uh, record is going to be he is going to have some pretty bad persecution of the new religion called Christianity, Going around at that time, uh, it was probably one of his co-emperors, uh, Galerius's idea, but he went with it. 
But Diocletian is going to be the only emperor of Rome to retire. That's right. He doesn't die in office. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and he is going to set up this amazing system. Uh, one thing that he does uh, is he really makes the Roman emperor even more like a god. Uh, many emperors were deified, meaning they were said to be gods after they died. Uh, but pretty much people weren't allowed to see him. Uh, so let's take a look at what he does here. So we have Western Rome and Eastern Rome. Now, these are not two separate emper empires yet. Um, <laughs> They will become two separate empires, but right now it is one Rome, but there are four emperors. We have, you know, Maximum, who is going to go, or Maximium, I'm sorry. He's going to be the emperor, uh, the Augustus in the West. We have Constantius I, the Caesar in the West, the under-emperor. Then we have Diocletian in the East at Nicomedia, and then Galarius, who is going to be his Caesar. So this is going to be this great system. Now, we know Diocletian, he, uh, he hated the city of Rome. He thought it was filthy. He thought it was overcrowded, and just he did not like Rome. So he's actually going to move the capital, uh, like I said, to uh, Nicomedia. Uh, and he's going to stay there. He actually, um, he only visits Rome once in his entire reign, and he hates it so much he like wants to get out of there. So like we said, uh, we have our four emperors it's going through. And the whole idea was after uh, it was his 20-year anniversary, Diocletian is going to want to retire. And he's going to make Maximian uh, retire as well, which Maximian doesn't really want to do. We're going to see Maximian gets involved in politics afterwards and eventually ends up dying for it. Uh, and after these two retire, then Galarus and Constantius are going to become the new Augustus. And then we'll have two new Caesars. Now, here's the thing that um, Diocletian believed in this and liked this, and Diocletian was just a good enough ruler where he could make this work. But once Diocletian gets out of the picture, this is going to go to heck in a handbasket. Uh, this is a picture of his palace. He uh, lived in this beautiful palace. He grew cabbages, uh, much like Cincinnati. I don't know what it is with uh, these Romans and their cabbages, but yeah, he was a cabbage farmer. Uh, it's really cool. We look at the modern pictures. We see how the city is like built like into and around his palace. It's pretty cool. Um, I love getting to show pictures like this. So we are going to have um, these leaders die. Now, Constantius has a son named Constantine, whom you might have heard of. Uh, he is not made uh, the Caesar of the West when Constantius is made the Augustus. And Constantius is going to die um, relatively young. And uh, Constantine is going to wind up just going, declaring himself Augustus, even though, um, you know, he wasn't even Caesar. And we're going to see how this is going to wind up changing everything. That whole system, by the way, was called the Tetrarch, uh, the Tetrarchy, um, and it's short-lived. And like I said, it needed um, it needed Diocletian to work. They even actually begged Diocletian to unretire, and Diocletian is like, "No, there's no way I'm getting back in this. You guys handle this yourselves." Now you'll notice that there are three dates for Constantine's rule. 305 to 324, and that is when he ruled in the West, and then 324 to 337. Constantine is going to be famous for a number of reasons. The main thing is he is going to unify Rome one last time. He will be the last man to rule a united Roman Empire. Uh, and of course, he's going to do this through civil war. Um, he is also going to be famous because he is going to wind up issuing something called the Edict of Milan, which is going to grant religious freedom and toleration, meaning Christianity is going to become legal. And even they're going to um, give back land that was taken from Christians, um, which is going to be a huge first. Uh, he is going to actually um, create the Council of Nicaea, which is going to try to unify church doctrine. Um, some of you might be familiar with something called the Nicene Creed. Uh, it's something that my church um, says every now and then. That is partially because of Constantine, which is kind of wild.
He's also going to make a new capital of Rome. He's going to make the city of Byzantium uh, be known as Constantinople. That means the city of Constantine, because just like uh, Alexander the Great, when you need a name of a city, you might as well name it after yourself, right? And uh, he is also in that process going to pretty much take all of the wealthy and smart and awesome people of Rome and have them come there with him. So let's take a look at how Constantine does this. So like we said, um, we are going to have Constantine. He is going to wind up going and um, declaring himself Augustus. And then actually Maximum or Maximium, he is going to uh, have a son named Maxentius and Maximian is going to wind up after Constantius dies, say, well, I'm back in it. I'm going to take over. Uh, Constantine winds up going, doing battle with him, capturing him. And uh, Maximian uh, chooses to uh, remove himself from the situation, probably uh, with Constantine's suggestion. He's then going to go to war with Maxentius, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and uh, defeat Maxentius. Uh, then there's going to be two emperors in the east and one in the west, Licinius and Dia. And uh, so let's talk about this battle with uh, Maxentius. So what's going to happen is there's a couple different versions of this story. The long story short is Constantine uh, was becoming beloved. Constantine was creating a huge army, uh, but Maxentius held Rome, which had the the large, large uh, walls, not like the Theodosian, but the um, the Aurelian walls were, were tall. They were strong. And Maxentius was starting to become hated by the Romans. But if he stayed in his walls, probably Constantine would have lost. Maxentius had more men, although they weren't, weren't as well trained nor as loyal as Constantine's. Well, there's a couple versions of the story. One version of the story is uh, Constantine... Uh, he sees a vision. He sees uh, a Cairo in the sky. Cairo is C-H, uh, and it looks like this. It looks like a P and an H, or blah, P and an, um, an X together. Um, that becomes the sign of Christ. It actually wasn't the sign of Christ yet. It uh, was a sign that meant um, good, um, and then heard, under this sign, you will conquer. Another version of the story we see pictured here, where Constantine and his men um, see a vision. Uh, some histories say that he was actually visited by Christ, and he sees a cross, and then it says, under this sign, you will conquer. But either way, Constantine says he has a vision um, from the God of Christianity that if he uses uh, the the symbol for Christ that he will be victorious. Now, neither of these symbols were used at the actually at the time, so probably some of this was um, made after the fact. Some stories say he painted uh, his men's uh, Cairo on men's shields. One story has the men saying, "Ah, oh, Jupiter will strike us down if we do it," and then Constantine goes, "I will strike you down if you don't." Um, others probably think maybe he had a banner or some sort of symbol to represent Christianity that he went and fought for. But basically, um, Constantine is going to go and use the the, the power of the Christian God. Uh, in, in the name of the Christian God as he fought uh, Maxentius. Maxentius uh, was very much on the side of Roman paganism. Now, Maxentius, he had all of the bridges to Rome uh, destroyed, uh, and he created a, haste, uh, a hastily done pontoon bridge. That's a bunch of little boats uh, tied together, basically. And he's going to wind up meeting uh, Constantine in battle. A lot of historians think he should have stayed in Rome, but he doesn't. Um, the fun part of this is there's a legend that uh, it was the sixth anniversary of Maxentius taking power, and the Romans thought those kind of anniversaries were very important. So he goes um, to some soothsayers, and they go and do a sacrifice, and they uh, they sacrifice a lamb, and then or maybe a goat, I can't remember, and they look at the liver, and they look at the spots, and then. The priest will say, oh, well, your future says this. Well, it says that on the sixth anniversary of Maxentius's reign, uh, the day after 
um, that Constantine receives his vision that he shall conquer under the sign of Christ. Uh, the priest of Jupiter tells Maxentius, oh, it says the enemies of Rome will be defeated. Now, of course, Maxentius says, well, I'm the ruler of Rome, so I am Rome. So that means Constantine will die. Um, and so he abandons his strong position and goes out to attack Constantine. Oh, boy. Um, now, fun fact, uh, Constantine uh, was loved. Uh, people, as Constantine was coming in to the territory, was greeting him as a hero. Maxentius was hated. Um, and so we get to the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, or the battle near where the Milvian Bridge used to be, but was destroyed by Maxentius, which doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? Well, Maxentius goes and attacks and Maxentius has his lines, even though he has way more soldiers than him, very close to the Tiber River. And so when Constantine goes and is able to push them back with his better trained superior troops, um, it starts becoming chaotic. Soldiers are falling into the water. So they start charging over that quickly made pontoon bridge, where, of course, uh, we have Maxentius on that bridge. It says that he gets pushed off by one of his own men and drowns because he's wearing armor. Um, Constantine uh, wins the day, marches into Rome, and declares himself ruler of the West. So Constantine becomes emperor of the West. And one year later, roughly, he goes and issues the Edict of Milan, saying Christianity is, le is legal. You can't persecute Christians anymore. Um, so... There you go. He wins. There's another version of the story where Maxentius, like, apparently tried to rig the bridge to break when Constantine went on it, and then it didn't break, and he's, like, hopping up and down, really furious, wondering why Constantine won't go on it, and then it breaks on himself. Um, I've heard less, less sources have that version of the story, so... I'm going with the one that I just told you right there. Although it's a fun one too. He built a victory arch because that's what you do. Now, of course, Constantine has to now make some allies. So he goes and says, Licinius, let's work together to get rid of Daya. Daya doesn't like Christians. You say you like Christians. So let's work together, get rid of Daya. So they make an agreement that there should only be two emperors of Rome. So Daya, au revoir. You're gone. You're dead. Um, now, let's think about this. Constantine, does he seem like he'd want to share with Licinius? Uh, they pretend for a little while. They actually um, try to reinstate the Tetrarchy. Um, Constantine makes his son um, uh, Caesar. Unfortunately, his son will die mysteriously. We have a lot of rumors of the evil stepmother because he winds up having two other um, sons with his new wife, Fausta. Um, maybe, maybe not. Licinius is actually uh, related to um, to Constantine, he's his brother-in-law. Constantine had his sister marry Licinius to make this agreement. Uh, and despite that, um, they go to war, um, and Constantine winds up defeating him, becoming the sole ruler of Rome. So, one ruler, one Rome. Now, some people call Constantine the first Christian emperor. <laughs> Maybe, you know, I think uh, historians often want to go paint him that way. Uh, he, de it seems like he probably, at least by the end of his career, believed in Christianity. Um, definitely, at least in the beginning, it seemed like he would try to get on whatever God's side he could uh, for victory. So it may be for politics. It may not be. Um, there are t plenty of evidence of him sacrificing to the Roman gods, although when he takes Rome, he does not go sacrifice to Jupiter, which was the tradition. So who knows? But Constantine winds up going and changing Rome completely. He's going to be a powerful emperor. He's going to, like I said, the last person to rule a united Roman Empire. He takes Byzantium, which is right here, turns into Constantinople, which will be one of the greatest cities the world will ever know. I mean, we've already talked about it. He goes and tries to fix the economy again, much like um, Diocletian did. And he's a little bit more successful with this as well. So he goes, helps the inflation by removing more of the bad coins and making more good ones. Like I said, he makes a new Roman capital. This is a small fishing uh, town, and he is going to make it awesome. 
Uh, he's going to go have the borders expanded. He's going to wind up going and making this huge. And one of the things that he does, too, is he makes this the first Christian city of Rome. There are no Roman pantheon temples in here. There are no temples to any of the Roman gods. But there will be many churches. Now, we know that this city is going to grow and grow. We have the walls of Constantine. We talked about the Theodosian walls earlier this year. And this is Constantinople, if you don't remember it. Here are we see the grandeur. We see a giant statue of Constantine. And it's gold. Hmm. Definitely liked himself. And definitely also didn't uh, dispute the air of how the, you know, the Roman emperors were treated like gods. Now, here are some of those Theodosian walls again. So what happens after Constantine... Well, he is going to leave Rome to his sons. Of course, his sons are going to wind up going and killing each other, and eventually it winds up going to two empires with two emperors who more competed rather than worked together. Rome no longer is the capital. Uh, Constantinople will be the capital in the east, and a place called Ravenna will be the capital in the west. Um, Rome is just falling apart. Constantine, as I mentioned earlier, took all of the rich, all the powerful, um, all the wealthy, all the good. And the big problem is the West was very poor. The West was just farmland. It was agrarian. The East was very wealthy. Now, after Constantine with Theodosius and uh, 395, Christianity has become the main religion of Rome. So it goes from being persecuted, um, you know, since... AD 66 or so under uh, Nero, I might have been off a couple years, to finally being legal in 313 AD, and then the official religion of Rome in 395. As time goes on, Western Rome's territory is going to shrink as many groups come in and invade. We see some of these invasions right here. So, Western Rome will end. 410, the Huns sack Rome. Sack means they steal everything valuable. 455, the Vandals sack Rome, stealing everything valuable. 476, we have Romulus Augustulus. We see the name of the founder of Rome, Romulus. We see the first emperor, Augustus, in this name. He is defeated by a barbarian named Odoacer. He was like 12 years old when this happens. And this is the fall of the Western Roman Empire. But we know the East will live on, called Byzantine. So that's going to be our notes for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. Um, I like this topic quite a bit, so I kind of went on a little bit. So I hope you don't mind too much. I hope you don't mind my hairdo either. I was wearing a hat earlier because I was outside with my little girl. Anyways, I miss you guys. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're having fun. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.